finished on the Bristol Holdings and the Gorham Home items, and we move on to item eight, the Bristol Beacon. And um, I think Stephen Peacock, we're still with you on this one to introduce. So thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, it's not long since we talked about this, and last time I was here it was to explain why we decided not to table a cabinet report. Clearly, you now see the cabinet report before you. I'm happy to take any questions that co uh, that uh, cabinet, uh, so that uh, members may have. Um, obviously, uh, I'm a lot of information has been shared, so I, I'm, I'll just put, leave, put myself open to any questions you may have or comments. Happy to take it, take anything that comes my way. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Who would like to go, Anthony? Okay, well, I mean, someone's got to start it off, so I, I, I'll start it off. The the uh, the paper, the public paper, does not make absolutely clear where the responsibility and the payments fall for the um, uh, for, for the overrun cost here. But it does make it very clear that there's there appears to be something like a forty four and a half million pound uh, shortfall. Um, it I, I would imagine that either your uh, no, I, I won't talk about what you're doing at the moment because that's probably exempt. But I, I, I'm hoping that there is some sort of conclusion being come to here with the with the contractor, and that that money is still to be allocated between the contractor and Bristol City Council. Or are you saying that all that forty four point four million pounds is extra cost to Bristol City Council? Page two of the cabinet report states the council is to continuing to negotiate with Wilmot Dixon, but accept that we retain liability for events and costs which have not been foreseen at the point of contracting. It's there in the, the, in the public report, councillor. Um, it's an NECA contract. We are negotiating to eventually pull together a deed of variation, which reflects the reality of the contracting form that was entered into. OK, can I then ask why, when there was a pre-contract on this site and there was a structural analysis and engineers reports about the fabric of this building, why that information did not properly inform the preparation of the tenders and obviously, uh, most importantly, the lowest tender? Because it seems that you, what you're saying is none of those things were included in that uh, price to the, uh, the the contractor offered, and yet we had conducted a process to to determine those particular items. Why were they then not informed to the contractor? So obviously, as you know, work began uh, in a 2018, and the information that was available at the time was based on a, a, what was a, 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 a identifiable through the survey, any surveys that could be done in a live concert venue. At that point in time, the removing of any fabric beyond what was possible with a live venue would have effectively put the council in a position where we had in effect started to demolish a building, remove the ability for the Bristol Music Trust to create revenue from live, from live venues and would then have had no clear plan to actually refurbish the building. So at that point in time, the standard contract form was used, which was NECA, which, as you know, places design responsibility on the client. And there was a limited number of uh, things available to the council at that point. The advisors at the time made whatever assessment they could make that adequate provisions were being set aside within the contract. Clearly, what's happened is the volume and the nature of the unexpected discovery items compounded by COVID has, extreme, has, has exceeded the worst case scenarios envisaged by any of the parties at that point, including the contractors. I have to say, I, I think I did mention this to you last time, our focus recognises the fact that we are in contract on a, certain, on a certain basis. And so all of the effort has actually been to restate the project so that we can move forward. I appreciate your questions, but as I'm sure you are aware, it's been very difficult to stop doing the work we're doing about securing the future to answer questions about the past, which from a legal perspective have no bearing on the place we find ourselves. Okay, final question. What, uh, when did the pre-contract uh, and the engineer's reports 
Uh, when did they end and were presented? And when did the main contract start? I'll have to get back to you. I'm afraid I don't have that information. Well, I mean, it's on the contract programme. You must have that stuck on your wall. I don't have that information to hand. As I've made it very clear, our focus has been on fixing the problems as we find them. I'd be very happy to take that away as a request. And Nancy, if you could help I'm me to provide the sure. I'm interested in making sure that the proper cost goes to the proper people uh, so that Bristol City Council is best protected. So uh, that, that's my concern. It should be the concern of this committee. So I want to make it very, very clear, and Nancy, you may be able to help, that we have a full team of legal advisors who are doing their utmost to protect the council's position. And clearly, we don't want to pay for things that are not our liability. The start point for this exercise from a legal point of view was to be very, very clear on what we were and were not liable for as client. I appreciate your question, but we, we, are, we are talking about a live project for which contracts were signed some time ago. And we are looking to move on from that point to a secure best value based on where we find ourselves. So I, I, you know, I, can't, I can't give you the answer to the questions about the history, but I can assure you that the legal team, both it, with Nancy's support from an in-house lawyer and also our external counsel, have been absolutely clear about the start point for the renegotiation. OK, thank you. I, I do want those points. Somebody else can answer them, I'm sure. Thank you. So, Councillor Negus, can I just... Uh, can I just make sure that I've understood exactly what you want? Could you repeat what you wanted? Thank you. Just so I'm clear. I've asked, uh, I've asked for certain key dates. It's all in an email. Um, uh, uh, I think about seven or eight key dates. And when I was told that it was too difficult to get all that key, all that information, I then said, no, it isn't. It's all on the project program. Ah, OK. So, so Councillor Negus, uh, can, I'll, I'll respond to you separately about that because... Yeah, thank you. Right, anybody else? So, Stephen, the, the, I, I understand that the, the, the importance of dealing with a live contract and, and taking this forward. Um, but I hope you can see from a member's point of view and from a member of the public point of view, the, the extent by which this project has come out over the original figure is absolutely huge. Now, I, I think the first problem is in terms of the report that I, I can understand why it was worded the way it was in an attempt to make the figures look slightly less than they actually were. But it's interesting that the local media actually didn't all understand the figures in the same way. So at least in one place, they added the overspend onto the 106 million and came up with 170 million as the cost of the project. So I'm actually, you know, and I look at that, that informed journalists were finding it difficult to pick out of the report the, the, the information which members were at least aware of because we'd been briefed. Now, um, I can't help but therefore need to know information about the history um, because I find it difficult that the roof was removed before we knew the extent of the problem so that we are now in a situation where the the only option is to proceed with the build with the cost in place and i find it unusual that nowhere in in the concerns about cost has there been mention about value engineering to bring the cost down now I, I'm not a fan of value engineering because one usually ends up with a less good project than, 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 than you'd intended to have in the first place. But I'm, I'm surprised it's not being suggested as a consideration. Okay. So I, can, um, I can't speak to things that are in the exempt paper. There is, a, there is a, an issue on risk in the exempt paper that I can't speak to in open session. Um, but I can give you a general point, which was the value engineering was baked into the original um, project. And you can see what that delivered. Yeah. So I, I share your sense that it's better to have clarity over numbers you can believe in than an aspiration to work 
collaboratively be on numbers that are less substantial. And that is our focus now. It's about locking in the numbers. And I can quote the figures. It, I'm, I find it, I mean, maybe we should talk about the numeracy of the media, because let's be honest, it's not hard to see on page two, 106.9 million writ large. And I do take issue with your suggestion that we sought to minimise the number. I think that is, that is entirely unfounded. It's absolutely 100% clear for anybody who has a modicum of an understanding of how to add up that 106.9 million is the, out, is, the, is the outturn cost. It's an increase because of the nature of where the money comes from in, in council capital of 44.5 million, which is in on page three under, recommend, uh, under recommendation one. So there is no attempt to downplay or hide anything. And I, I, take, I take issue with any suggestion otherwise. It's a very significant project. We are completely upfront. But what has happened is at the extreme end of what with anybody. And let's be honest, there are a lot of people, a lot of advisors, a lot of experts, and experts do matter, who, who got this wrong, who said it was, you know, they thought it was within the tolerance of risk and clearly the project surprised everybody. It revealed itself to everybody. The issue about the, um, the, the nature of the contract and the issue about the order in which work was done, of course, those are conversations that can run. Um, I would not see fit myself to, just to, to, to view on whether it was right to take the roof off before you take the walls down. But my logical brain tells me that if you're demolishing a building and keeping a shell, taking the roof off needs to happen. It's not my job to second guess a con construction company. You know, we entered into contract to refurbish the building. So I appreciate all the, all the anxiety and all the concern, I really do. You can understand how hard we are working to put this right, to get a new contracting form together and to move forward with confidence. The figures in the paper that are also important to note are that we have moved since December, since we first briefed you, in fact, because the data didn't change between December and early February when we met, we've moved from a point where 76% of that figure was, as we call green, as in lockdown and a fixed price, to one now, which is at 92%. And I have to say that pulling the paper from the cabinet was important because that number continued to move over that two week period. So you asked the question last time, why did we pull it? I said to you, we were finding it challenging to work with Wilmot because we had, were trying to translate the agreement we had into binding contracts. There's been, there's been a lot of progress. It really has become more about certain prices rather than vague agreements for value engineering to work collaboratively. So we're making great strides here. I appreciate everybody's concern about the number but it is a, really a question of where we go from here. You know, I'm sure members don't want us to leave the building open to the elements and not have the beacon back. I appreciate everyone, I assume everybody wants us to finish the job. That is a, every ounce of our effort is on that, is on finishing the job, on locking down the cost, on using Nancy and her lawyers to protect the council and protect the council taxpayer. Because, you know, we don't want this project to slip again. We don't want any more you know, any more problems with this project. We're, we are working as hard as we can and we're nearly there with Wilmot. We're not quite there, but we are nearly there. We think we are close enough to take this to Cabinet. Thank you, Stephen. I may come back, but Stephen Clark. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, um, in, in risk. We've, we talked a lot about risk and in a construction project, risk equals money. You can, you can pay a bit less and have a bit more risk or, or the other way around. Now, Nancy, I'll, I'll try not to get into exempt and I'm not looking for specific answers really, but I'm looking for a philosophy of risk. So at this stage, we must know, because there's been a lot of people who've poured over this building in great detail, we must know, I, I, I would guess, where the risk lies. You say that 92% of the risk has been covered, has been passed off effectively to the contractor. Um, I, I'm just interested in what was your philosophy there? Did you say it's really important that we pass off more risk, therefore we're going to pay a bit more money to the contractor to take on that risk? Yeah, what was, what was the philosophy of the, the division of the risk? A really good question. Um, what's happening right now? is that there are teams from both sides who are poring over 
a, a declining number of issues. There are, there are specific work packages. They are pulling them apart and they are working out what it's going to cost to do in terms of time and material. When they've reached agreement, so that's ourselves, our project managers, our cost consultants and Wilmot, they then decide, okay, can we go firm on that? And that case, that, that becomes a basically a firm price. I, we talk about green, yeah, that's when it goes green. So you've got a scope of works, materials, and a, and a specific deliverable that is for a particular price. What that doesn't do, and this is a general point, so it's not exempt, in the context, in the context of a contract like this, if you then come along and you say, well, okay, but that 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 floor, you know, that that floor in the basement where we were going to lay some 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 flooring and we got a fixed price for the flooring, it transpired that we needed to actually rip the floor up underneath because it wasn't stable. So we got the input assumption on that particular work package wrong. So there were examples about the way that work packages give you protection, as long as you're really, really clear on what goes around it, there's always a risk. There's always a risk in this type of contract that you haven't got your, your external factors fully fully weighed in the balance, and then you as a client will be liable. You know, if, it, if I had to put, if I had to dig out the floor, do another two weeks work, lay a new new screed, screed floor on it, then I'm gonna charge you for that. But if, if I told you that I'd done the work and that floor was good to put slabs on, that's on me as the contractor because I told you that was good. That was good. A good flooring. I've, that's a that's a simplistic example of where the packages have got to be really specific about what's the assumption in there, and then it's the contractor standing behind the assumptions that were made to deliver that package, and then you fix the price. When you add that all up and you say it's ninety two percent green, there is always then that rolled up set of issues and risks where because it's not a guaranteed maximum price contract, the client will bear a sort of a risk, if you like, between those work packages, the sort of the gaps between them or outside them, you know, external things that could come along that, um, that hadn't been envisaged. You're right to say, councillors are right to say, there has been a, a huge and just a huge amount of work done to shake this tree as hard as we can. So there's nothing that's not known. Now, can I sit here and say, that means that nothing else will ever come up? Of course I can't, but have I, have I looked everybody in the eye and have we brought you know, a huge amount of focus on that very specific point? Absolutely. And also let's not forget, compared to where we were, this building has fully revealed itself. So you know, there are no hidden nooks and crannies left. I did send some 3D imagery. I don't know if Council Gollop, you've yes, got. I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary when you go there. And I, I know Councillor Award went. You, you you can see it all now. It's fully open. So the reality is, it would be incredibly disappointing if if things arose that no one had mentioned that were that should have been there for everyone to see. That's that's ultimately that will all, always come back to the client because we own the building. Jeff, can I come back? Yeah, please. So I, I, I'm slightly confused now then. So what you're saying is the 92% that's green yep. isn't really green, it's kind of light green, or it's probably green. It's green as long as you've got your input assumptions correct. So that, in other words- that's no I mean, different from when we started the project, is it? I mean, the, so we at no stage we got, I mean, I understand broadly how NEC works. So we haven't got any, um, there's still risk within that 92%. There will always, yeah, there'll always be risk until until we hand the project over the BMT. But there is provision well, the one, within the there is provision within the con, within the budget for some risk, which we can't get into in detail because it's an exempt item. But well, so we can talk about the contingency we've got here. Well, no, no because it's exempt because we're negotiating because because we're neg still negotiating. We haven't got a deed of variation or any of the annexes, but it, it's an exempt item. I think Nancy, is that right? I mean, you've put forward a you know, robust defence to the problems that have arisen. Um, I think there should be, I'm not really talking about you, I'm, I'm talking about the general approach. There should be a certain amount of humility here that yes, we, you know, very lots of experts have got this wrong in lots of different ways because the quantum of what's happening is, you know, as Jeff said, to the general public, this is bonkers. And I'm not sure that that tone has been quite um, hit within this report or within some of the 
um, the public statements that have been made? I think that's one for the administration. Uh, you would want me, that would be inviting me to comment on previous administrations and I don't think I'm able to do that. On the previous administration, what do you mean? I just refer you to the chronology in the annex paper to, to, to give you an idea of why this project didn't start until 2016, but I can't go into areas which would be inappropriate as an officer for me to comment on. Suffice to say, I look deeply into the archive, but I don't think it would be appropriate to say anything more. I don't know if I understand that comment, but I don't actually. Anyway, uh, I, I finished, Jeff. I think I've made my point. Thank you, Stephen. Anthony? Uh, of, of more concern, I, I take Steve's point uh, of uh, about the uh, strength of the 92%. What are you saying about the 8%? Are, are you saying that that's, uh, uh, that is completely unresolved and therefore that... Uh, what is effectively eight point something million quid is still up for grabs? No, what we're saying is that as of today, um, we have achieved that cost certainty that was it was within the caveats I mentioned on 92% and negotiations are ongoing. And whether or not we decide to contract, and this is getting into territory, I don't I don't think we can do. But 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 there is there's still a choice to be made about about when and how we choose to, as it were, confirm and settle the, the items that will still remain subject to further work um, and for which we need to keep a provision outside of any contract we sign, but I can't really get into specifics. The, the issue for, for us, as I've hopefully explained, is we've been moving towards a point where, where you know, enough of the the, the known knowns and the known unknowns, et cetera, were defined and categorized such that in totality, there was a, there was a, a sense and a confidence that we should sign a deed of variation with all the attachments with the contractor. There will probably be a list of things still to be confirmed for which we will hold back some money uh, because otherwise you could be waiting for months you know there might be small things that you don't feel are, are appropriate to fix today they might be a year away i don't i don't have the detail on it but clearly we've covered the bar, the vast bulk of the of the inventory of works the work scope has already been covered in that 92 percent hence we feel it's appropriate to get to a point where as soon as possible pending subject to a cabinet decision we would seek to enter into contracts okay uh, yeah, uh, at the very beginning of this meeting i i mentioned my, my concern that bristol city council had the right expertise to deal with people whose job it was in life to make sure that they could get the best for their company that were on the other side of the table as it were i i think that's i have to say i think that's reflected in this contract uh, it, 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 people need to know that this is that the the cost overrun of this is actually almost exactly the same cost as the original contract cost. Um, in other words, we've doubled because we didn't know what was going on. And anybody with any expertise would know that with a with a with a heritage building in the middle of an old city, you take the time and trouble to make sure you eliminate those unknowns as much as possible. And if it takes a couple of months longer to get to that point. That's what you do because you can actually save the vast bulk of what's turned out to be 44 and a half million quid here. Jeff, I'm going to ask that in our report the, uh, about the Bristol Beacon, because we had a much longer conversation last time, but this is the public bit. Uh, I'm going to say that we should call for an inquiry. I think that this has been, I, I, I'm afraid, and, and I, you know, of particular people here aside, this has gone on for a long time, this contract. At, 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 stages in this contract it has clearly been very badly handled and it, we should learn from this that we, we that this is one of the biggest cuck-ups frankly in, in the construction industry at the moment in this country uh, it, it is horrendous in, in terms of the extra cost okay, and and we should can, learn. can i yeah can i can, can, can take your comment there claire's caught my eye and I, I just when when Claire spoke, and I just want to check with um, Celia and Lucy just to, to to see whether you're happy to say nothing, or whether you have a whether you share concerns and questions that have been expressed. Because we've got to try and work out what comments we we put into cabinet. So, Claire, over to you, and then and then Celia and Lucy. 
Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, my observation on, on this issue is that it appears that, Stephen, you're not the person we should be asking about the history of this project. You've come in and quite rightly, you want to take it forward, as do we all. Um, however, it is scrutiny's job to look at why things go haywire. Um, and I think it's absolutely important that there is some expression of that concern that we haven't been able to ask those questions. Um, and also I am with um, Councillor Negus that there does need to be some inquiry because otherwise we're never gonna get an explanation as, as to why it overran. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a director of the Bristol Old Vic Theatre. We've just gone through a refurbishment. Um, you know, we had uh, a, a very robust contract um, in a, you know, in a, a building, you know, hundreds of years old. Um, and yes, we went a bit over budget, but nowhere near this. And um, believe me, we found some fun things in, in you know, literally the oldest working theatre in the country. Um, and so it does strike me that, you know, if, if the old Vic can, can hold a, get a contract that works and, you know, St George's has, has managed to sort themselves out, um, you know, there's a big question over why the council managed to go, well, managed to get it so horribly wrong. So at some point, we do have to have answers to those questions. Um, Stephen, you cannot answer them, but somebody has to. Yep. Um, and if the only way to get those answers is an inquiry, then I, I'm all for it. Right. Thank you, Claire. Um, so, Celia, just, just really to try and get a feel from, from members, um, you know, you, we, we've we've had lots of concerns expressed. Um, I, I sort of want to try and avoid this being a, a party political issue, I, and, and 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 I'm just trying to see whether whether you share the concerns about the the project and the the information and the situation that we find ourselves in. Can I, Lucy had her hand up. Can I? Defer to Lucy to, she might have a question. Okay. And, and yeah. Yeah. Thank, Lucy, you. Thank you, Celia. I don't have anything new to add, unfortunately. Uh, if you're all excited, I heard something. Um, I, um, I agree with Claire. I think that um, what would be important would be the attitude in which we approach an inquiry where um, we're really focusing on what we can learn so that we can do it more like the old Rick. Uh, if we have a big project like this in the future. The fact that it is possible is really exciting because um, when I was first hearing about the problems faced, I thought, well, of course, that does just sound impossible to try and manage. But clearly buildings have been able to manage that and learning what we could do differently next time, I think, for me, would reduce defensiveness, accusations, blame. Um, I'm sh Yeah. That I think that it's how we approach it would be important. Yes, thank you, Lucy. That's that's really helpful, Celia. Well, I would agree. I mean, this is not my area of expertise at all, so it, it is it is a tricky one, I think. But clearly, when you look at the project and all the photographs that we've seen, because we have been part of this process, I think all the way through, we were invited down to the. Um, the hall before all of this started and, and you know things were discussed um again i think my comment would be let's have ongoing scrutiny consultation discussion about you know going forward um the bristol beacon is a is a city-wide used facility and and i think it would be a great tragedy if it was lost um Sorry, that's a very general point, but I think I think it, it is important. 
I feel it's important to keep going uh, if we can. Right. So no, I, so I think that's really helpful because this is helping to shape the, the, the sort of comments that, that we make. And I, and I think, so I, I've jotted down a few notes and if I, if I read those out as, as, as a basis. So I, I started off by saying that members were concerned about the significant additional spend that members recognised officers um, had put an enormous amount of work in to, to, to get into the stage we are, um, but remain concerned at how the situation has evolved. Um, how we see the need for ongoing scrutiny and consultation as this moves forward, and that we feel there are significant lessons that need to be learnt from this and therefore we would hope that the council would put in place an inquiry to investigate how this happened and to learn lessons from what is discovered. Is, is, is that a fair reflection Celia? Yes I, I would agree with those statements and this is the sort of worst case scenario of any any building isn't it that you find absolutely everything that could go wrong has gone wrong and um, if you knew that at the beginning you maybe would have changed you know your starting yeah. point yeah. but we are where you, we Julie, are Julie, can i interrupt just while you're talking because the other thing i th i want to i think i think we'd all agree we want to put in there was your comment of earlier is that we all recognize how important the colston hall is and we want to see the project progressed because I, I i i wouldn't want anything we say to be slowing down and that's where i Stephen, have enormous sympathy with you that you're trying to do the progression um and and and, and we're de delaying by asking questions about the past now we can't stop being concerned about that but i think we do need to to make sure that the cabinet sees that we recognize the need to move it forward Thank and you, just Jeff. to say, you know, the, the option, as, as indicated, to mothball of just leaving a shell just doesn't seem right. No, no, because that would only build a larger problem for the for the future, I'm sure. Um, I, it, there, were, there was someone else before you, Anthony, I think. But yeah, Stephen and uh, Lucy and Claire, were you trying to catch my eye or were you agreeing with the statement? Agreeing with the um, statement. OK, cool. So, Stephen and then Anthony. Well, just at the start of it, I, I can't remember whether you said this or not, Jeff. We should express our um, surprise, horror. I'm not sure what the right n a number is, but at the sheer quantum of this. That, you know, it's it's quite startlingly out of the out of the out of the norm for any kind of building project that I've ever heard about. Yeah. Um, and I think we should express that that surprise. Um Apart from anything else, it must have been known for you know a very long time that it is going to be way, way over budget. Um, I, I would like to come back on that, if you don't mind, Chair, because that's that's simply not the case. And the, the extent of how far over budget was was a running commentary that in which I had no faith because I was getting too many uh, messages on a weekly basis which is why we went through the process and we purposefully said to the team, don't come back to us with any numbers until you've built the programme. And so I do want to be very, very clear with everybody and members know this because you saw the scrutiny, you saw the exam session, that it was only when we had confidence in a number that we could bring it back because we didn't believe what we were seeing at a point in time and we rebuilt it from the ground up. So Councillor Clark, it's really important that people understand that we wanted to get it right and then we brought it to a closed session with scrutiny. That is yeah. why. Can I, can, I, can, I just in, Steve, can I just interrupt there and say I, I, I endorse that. And if I say we're, we're actually only in this position because of Stephen Peacock, I don't mean that critically. I mean that, that, that actually if Stephen, I, and I'm, I'm guessing Stephen, is you, your professional instinct told you that something wasn't, wasn't right in what, in, in, in what was being seen that forced you to keep progressing it. So the fact the papers got delayed were down to that instinct rather than to anything else. And yeah. I, th there was a there was an awareness that that members were made aware of last summer, but that was not a complete picture. Yeah. 
Yeah. And if we go back to optimism bias or whatever it was, it might have been what everyone wanted to hear. Um, but and, and that's why I'm very keen that Stephen isn't isn't it, it, it isn't given a hard time because he's the messenger, because he's actually the one who's who's brought this to a head rather than allowing us to go on and the problem being deferred for another 12 months before it was was recognized. So, um, so, so, so I, think I, th I think I think, though, that you're right about expressing. I mean, we can't help being shocked by the figure. Um, and we wouldn't expect Stephen to comment, but I'm guessing that he was probably shocked by the figure as well. So, so we 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 we, we can express that, but I I really don't want it to be. I, I I accept we need to be critical of the process that has caused us to get this wrong for so long, but it shouldn't be critical of the officers currently in place who've who who've delivered a a much clearer paper than we've we've ever had before. Anthony, I. I, I wanted to say both of those points but I want them to be given a slightly different emphasis. The first thing is that I think we should applaud the, the, the efforts to get this contract to, to know where we stand with this contract. My point has always been that we should have done this uh, rather sooner, we should have had a process to make sure we didn't need to do it in the first place and for a contract to be a hundred percent over budget is, is something which is frankly it will probably make history. So, uh, you know, and, and this will be for a long time cited as, as a contract that went horribly wrong um, in, in the history of contracts. So, you know, yeah, that, Antico, you, can, I, can I just move you on, though, because you, you have point. made that point and we've yeah. acknowledged okay. it. That, that, well, I, I'm making that's a slightly different point. But I did want to make the point before it became up earlier that we are being asked here today um, uh, uh, to our comments about the cabinet decision and the cabinet decision is whether we go ahead or not. This meeting, a cross-party meeting, and the briefing that we had, oh, I don't know, three weeks ago, I'm pretty sure was unanimous that we should go ahead. And I think we need to make that point very strongly, that despite where we are, this is too important to drop at this stage, as much as for the worth of this building, as for the loss it would cause this city and this city council if we did not proceed. The, the downside, the obverse of this decision is, is massive. So for both those reasons, we want to be very positive about saying, advising the cabinet that this committee reflects the earlier briefing as well, that we should go ahead, but then we should lead on, go on and say the things that we think have gone wrong. Yep. Can I just check with members that you're happy with that? Yep. Yep. I think that's that's very fair. Thank you, Anthony. Right. I think we've 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 heard this one, and I'm I'm just looking to to, to Lucy to check that you, you and Joe have got the have got what you need for a statement to cabinet. We have. Yeah. Thank 